I'm Peter Block in Orlando, Florida at the ACC annual meeting, and I'm here for On the Scene. I'm the moderator of this group. To my left is Tony DeMaria. In the middle is Kim Eagle, both good colleagues and friends. As you can see, uh, there was recently a sale on ACC ties. I did not make it, but the two people to my left did uh, inadvertently. In any case, we have some good trials to talk about this morning. This is wrap up day three and <clears throat> arguably the best or most newsworthy trial of this entire meeting is the black barbershop hypertension trial. Kim, uh, you were sitting in the meeting on the panel. Tell me about that trial. I, I absolutely love this trial. Uh, Ron <clears throat> Dicker and his colleagues in Los Angeles recruited uh, almost 50 barber shops where uh, black patrons with hypertension went in. They had their blood pressures checked by a pharmacist. If they were high, they were started on antihypertensive therapy and uh, a group was compared to control. And going to the scene and taking care of these individuals in the barbershop had a profound effect. It lowered their blood pressure from about 154 systolic to 127 systolic. A huge difference that was sustained over six months. This is really a paradigm shift for us, thinking about diseases that don't hurt you, hypertension, high cholesterol, diabetes. How do we get into the community where these people are? Because they're not coming to clinic and really go after those things. And I, I absolutely love this study. Well, let me add to it, though, because there's imp important issues here, right? There have been previous studies in barbershops, haven't shown very much change. But this time, they had PharmDs in the barbershop. Absolutely. And Huge. those PharmDs tested their blood. They made sure their potassiums and creatinines were OK. And then they changed their medicines. And the medicines in the non-control group that actually did better were more um, used, they had many more different medicines given by the PharmD, and that's really what made the difference. Absolutely, so they worked with the PCPs, they chased down the patients to make sure they were right. up titrating their doses, and in doing that, they, they got control. Yeah, it's the more terrific. Care, the more care, the better. Go figure. <laughs> I guess, news to me. <laughs> Tony, any thoughts about this? So, I, I, I think there's a couple of things. Uh, number one, adherence is critically important because we all know you get patients on antihypertensives and the blood pressure comes down for a couple of months and then they stop taking them. But uh, uh, apparently uh, the frequency of haircuts was such that in fact these, these individuals, hypertensive individuals, knew they were coming back and that they, they were going to be tested again, so the adherence was, was very high. Every so, two weeks. Yeah, yeah so, every, every, two, every weeks. two weeks. So, so I think um, it's really, it, in, in San Diego, we, we had what they called uh, the, the group of a thousand um, black barbers doing a, a similar thing, and we found kind of a, in a similar fashion that unless you take action right. and pretty promptly, just telling somebody they have high right. blood pressure doesn't do you very much good. You've just got to act on it and act on it promptly. Yes. All right, well, let's move on. <clears throat> Another trial, the heart failure and hospital quality trial. Uh, we talked about this a little bit beforehand, and we all were scratching our heads a little bit about exactly what we learned from this, but the short version of this trial is that it was really to figure, to figure out what metric was the best for follow-up, to figure out quality of hospital care, and also what's the best metric for follow-up long-term to determine quality. In the past, we've used readmission rates, as you know, and admission rates are just a terrible way of, because you can game the system so easily by simply bringing the patient and leaving in the hospital. So the question really is, how do you best evaluate quality. Kim, thoughts about this? Well, certainly I've been frustrated by the readmission benchmark as a quality measure because studies have suggested that hospitals with lower readmission rates may have higher one-year mortality risk adjusted. So we have to do something more than that. Uh, so I, I, you know, I certainly think uh, adherence to evidence-based therapies is important. Uh, readmission, follow, following the patients into the community after they're discharged. There's so much to this that we've been sort of ignoring. And in fact, that's what the trial showed. The study showed that if you have a hospital that is the highest quality hospital, if you look more carefully at their care, they got more ICDs into patients, they made sure they were followed up at home, they had nurses in place that could follow the patients, and no surprise, mortality was less than 30 days. Go figure. Go figure. So, Tony, back to you. 
So uh, I, I think, again, you've, you've touched on, on the important aspects as far as I'm concerned, and that is that readmission rate really is a very weak parameter to assess quality. The concept that it, if you survive for 30 days, you're much more likely to survive for five years, I guess is somewhat predictable, <laughs> but, but I, I guess if you, you use landmark analysis that, that in fact, uh, that, that becomes somewhat reassuring for the heart failure patients to say, well, you've gotten through the most dangerous period after your hospitalization, you've, you've survived that, so your prognosis is improved. I think CMS will look at this trial and figure out that maybe a 30-day mortality metrics are the thing that they might use in the future going forward to evaluate whether they will financially reimburse hospitals for their care depending on their quality. That would be an interesting thing to find out. We'll see what happens. Yeah, I mean, it seems like that measure was developed with this notion that we're not trying hard enough to prevent readmissions. And, and you know, that, that may be true occasionally, but this is a very complicated situation. Multiple drugs, dose titrations, follow-up, blood pressure, renal function, it's a lot more than that. But what's, it, you know, it's interesting. Some of the studies that have done home monitoring and some of the studies that have employed nurses to, to make regular telephone calls and whatnot have really not shown that yeah. much of a difference. Yeah. So um, the extra intensive care here in this program, uh, I think, maybe had some special attributes. All right, let's move on. Uh, one more study before we call today. And that is the POI study. The POI study was done uh, a year ago or, or longer, and now we have a one-year follow-up on those POI patients. POI was the beta blockade for non-cardiac surgery, and Kim, you were also sitting on this panel. This uh, is uh, an important study because of the beta blockade issue for non-cardiac surgery. Sure is. POI was a uh, 8,000 patients randomized to high-dose beta blockers, 100 milligrams of toprol the night before, and then four hours after surgery. And, and then followed for 30 days and then at a year. And I think the important point of this trial is that if you give too much beta blocker, you hurt people. There was an excess mortality in the beta blocker group at 30 days and at one year. And it was, it was highly significant. And excess stroke. Excess stroke, hypotension. Yeah. So the message I think is if you think about who should get benefit from perioperative beta blockade, they probably should be patients with recent MI uh, patients who have systolic heart failure. And we don't want to use high fixed doses the night before and the day of. We want to titrate up. And certainly there's no signal that beta blockers are useful in people without an indication, like diabetics. Just giving diabetics beta blockers is not going to be a helpful thing to so do. So the guidelines say that if you are on beta blockade and have non-cardiac surgery, you should be continued. If you're not on it, you should not be given new beta blockade. And I guess the question about how much you are given at the time of surgery depends on your pressure. Tony, what are your thoughts about the guidelines in ongoing use of beta blockade well, as we have been using it? You know, we're re-examining beta blockade across the board. In, the, in patients who come in primary PCI and then completely revascularized at the moment, there's really no evidence that those patients benefit by beta blockers. Here's another instance where the judicious use of beta blockers is very important and, and they can actually have an adverse effect. So I, I, think, I, I think we're in a period of, of total reevaluation of the use of, of beta blockers. And the guidelines now say after three years after an MI, beta blockers may not be necessary anymore. There's no evidence no, no that they data. benefit. Yeah. No data whatsoever. Yeah. Well, as an interventionist, though, one thing that did come out of this one-year follow-up was that if you have an infarct for nine, after nine cardiac surgery, if you're revascularized, you do better. And that's uh, sort of saying, duh, but nonetheless, an interesting uh, metric that for uh, care of patients that get into trouble, uh, rather than just treat them medically, it may be better to think about revascularization. Totally agree. If you have a non-fatal MI after non-cardiac surgery, you've had a non-fatal MI. Yeah. And current standard of care is to evaluate those patients and look for and probably treat ischemia and interventionally if it's there. Yeah. Okay, well that's it for day three. Thank you very much, folks.